Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll just wait here a few minutes until, until uh, our participant level starts um, leveling off, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, I think we've leveled off there, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and get started now. My name is Marlene Wagner. I'm the South Coast Policy Lead for um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, we are having this Zoom meeting tonight. So I'll just start by briefly reading over the sort of logistics and ground rules um, for the night. Um, so you can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, everybody will be muted during the beginning of our program, and then we'll un unmute folks when we open it up for questions and feedback. Callers can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. We ask that you raise your hand to ask a question, which you can access through the control panel at the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants. And callers can raise their hand by dialing star nine. Um, please be respectful of each other. Um, please uh, mute your phone or line when you're not speaking. Be tough on the issues and the questions, but not on people or organizations. No personal attacks, insults, or threats. Um, make sure we're listening to each other and speak and act professionally. And uh, try to allow for a balance of speaking time so everybody can participate. We are recording the meeting. And uh, if you have any technical issues during the call, you can use the chat button. Um, which I think is at the bottom of your screen, it is on mine, um, and we can help you through those. But don't use that for questions or comments because uh, we're going to take those live tonight. Thank you. So yeah, we're uh, just going to get started here tonight. Um, we're going to do a really brief overview of the North of Falcon process. Um, so we'll during North of Falcon, we start with forecasting the abundance of each stock. From there, we can determine if there is a harvestable surplus. Once we have determined if we have a harvestable surplus and what that is, we can model fisheries to determine which stocks are going to be constraining stocks. We predict what will catch under different situations. Um, and then we negotiate with tribal co-managers and other states for sharing of catching stocks. And so, Currently, uh, uh, like at our last meeting, we're still on steps three and four. We're iteratively moving between modeling fisheries and predicting what we will catch. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, we're here tonight to go over the forecast and continue our discussion about our fisheries in Willapa Bay. Uh, we have a Grace Harbor meeting to do the same thing tomorrow night. Um, and we have the final Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting um, this week and next week. Again, all these materials in the meeting schedule and links can be found um, at the link on the bottom of the page. Next, and so now I'm gonna hand it over to Mark Baltzell, our statewide uh, salmon and steelhead manager to go over our ocean alternatives. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks Marlene and welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody being here tonight. Um, I think uh, everybody can see the ocean options that are on the screen right now. I mostly just wanted to give everybody an update as to where things uh, stood entering the Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings later this week. Uh, as folks know, the, the treaty tribes of Western Washington and the department um, have been in ongoing discussions about uh, acceptable harvestable levels in the ocean this year. Uh, as folks see, we have a range of options in front of us all the way down to zero. 
Um, I, uh, I did uh, just want to give folks a, a bit of caution that um, these discussions are ongoing and somewhat dynamic. Um, we don't really, I don't want to uh, make any predictions of, of what the outcomes might be at the end of next week, um, but we do have a, a lot of ways to go to get there. Uh, I also, as we've been thinking about things going forward, I wanted to just put a thought in folks' minds. If there was uh, a decision made uh, to have the ocean at zero this year, obviously that would have kind of downstream effects on other fisheries, right? I think as the department's thinking about these things and, and uh, the effects of a closed ocean, uh, we wanna be really careful about how we're considering other fisheries, i.e., um, you know, what would that look like from a, a Willapaw point of view? Uh, obviously, I don't think we would want to start on July 1. Uh, we'd have to be really cognizant of what our Lower Columbia natural impacts are. We would also want to consider um, uh, any effects of, of effort shifts uh, should the ocean be closed. So just wanted to throw that thought out there. Again, I'm not uh, predicting any doom and gloom. Um, but it is stuff that the department's thinking about. And maybe uh, I know it's a little early in the conversation and we still have some presentation to go, but I thought maybe I'd pause there to see if any folks on the line had any questions uh, about what I've just said that I can answer before we move on with the program. Remember, uh, if you're on your phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. And if you're on the Zoom link, there are a number of different ways uh, to raise your hand. There's an emotions button at the bottom. Sometimes there's a raised hand feature. So again, just, just wanted to give folks an opportunity to focus in on those questions before we moved on. Not seeing anybody. Well, for some reason, my slide doesn't want to advance here real quick. There we go. So I'm going to run through the management objectives for uh, Chinook uh, really quick for Willapa this year. Uh, on the 12th, the commission uh, adopted some interim guidance for this year. Uh, it directed the department to actively manage our Chinook fisheries not to exceed, or our fisheries total, to not exceed a 20% natural orange and Chinook impact uh, for Nacelle and Willapaw rivers, uh, suspend time and area restrictions for commercial fisheries south of 2T, uh, determine daily limits for wreck fisheries uh, for Chinook and Coho, uh, obviously try to achieve a season length to achieve recreational priority for Chinook uh, and continue to develop and implement um, test, fishery to, test fisheries and in-season update models. For coho, our guidance this year is the aggregate spawner goal for natural origin coho. Uh, the guidance for this year is to prioritize commercial fisheries on coho from mid-September through mid-October, and then also provide recreational opportunities. The CHUM guidance for this year is different than it has been in the recent past. Um, we're kind of out of the box, so to speak. Uh, our, our guidance for this year is to achieve the aggregate spawner goal for naturally spawning fish and then provide for uh, fishing opportunities for both recreational and commercial sectors. So with that, uh, I think this is where I'm gonna hand it over to Jody Pope. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm the District Bio for Willapa Bay and gonna walk you through a few of the models that we've, uh, all the models that we've received to date. Um, but I do want to make note, uh, make everyone aware that um, prior to this meeting, uh, while we were modeling the last model that we received, which would have been model E, um, we discovered a calculation error in the recreational harvest rates. So therefore, their adjustments are needed to our models. Um, the effects of this error equate to a decrease in impact rates for natural origin Chinook and an increase in escapement for natural origin coho. The models that I'm gonna to present to you tonight are still relative, and I will walk you through each of the proposals that we've received. 
And we as a staff will send out corrected models as soon as we can, uh, likely tomorrow or the next day. Um, so, and we are looking to have a follow-up meeting next week to walk you through the corrected models. Uh, that date isn't specific yet, specifically set, but we'll let everyone know uh, as soon as we have something, something set for you. So this first slide here, uh, everyone is, is mostly familiar with Willapa Bay. I just wanted to kind of share, share a map with you and uh, walk you through for folks that may not be familiar with Willapa Bay, what, what we're looking at here as far as fisheries go. Um, so you'll see on the far left of your screen, the commercial areas, you have 2T, 2U, 2K, 2N, 2R, 2M, 2P. Uh, you also have the marine area that, um, I can't use my mouse, but it's uh, just above 2T is Tokeland and the marine area is, is right essentially in, in 2T. And then um, what you'll see also are, is all the freshwater rivers uh, highlighted on this map. So on the top, near the top of your screen, the corner of uh, 2T and 2U, you've got North River and it's highlighted in dark blue. Uh, if you follow 2U upriver, you've got Forks Creek, Willapa River, South Fork River, South Fork Willapa River. Um, moving your way down, you've got the Palix River, uh, North Nema, all, all the Nemas, uh, the Nacelle Hatchery, and the Bear River. So kind of to try to orient you uh, just to where these fisheries are, are taking place this year. Next slide, please. So this first model is model A. This is the model that we first shared with you on uh, 317 at our first meeting. Um, this is the, the NALF run, which is new abundances with last year's fisheries on this. This model meets all management objectives. And let me back up a moment since this is a new format that we've tried to uh, share with you to visually understand how um, these proposals are received and what this looks like on your fisheries. So this is new to folks um, and, and really interested after all of this to, to get your feedback on this new format also. Um, so, so essentially what you're gonna see here is the model on the top, what model were, was proposed and what we've done with it. Every, every slide will um, share what the management objectives are, if they're met, if they're not, and what the escapement, the expected escapements will look like. It'll walk you through the uh, commercial, what the commercial fishery looks like and what your sport marine and freshwater uh, systems will look like as well. And then on the map, what you'll see is the areas in the big red circles are the areas of the commercial, um, proposed commercial fishing areas. And then uh, you'll see the individual rivers that are highlighted in dark blue. So for example, Forks Creek is highlighted that fisher that river would be open. Nema, Nema River to the hatchery would be open. Nacelle to the hatchery would be open. Um, and then there's just notes on there that you know South Fork, Willapa, and Nema Rivers would close October 1st in this particular model. And Highway 4 to Attraction Channel would be open October 16th, so closed prior to then. Um, and it's important to also note that all of the proposals that we've received minus the last one that we received over the weekend, so model E, all represent the same fishing, the fishing package is the same. So there's no change from this model with all the other ones except for model E. Hopefully that's not too, too confusing, but I can walk folks through each slide to, to orient you. So you've already seen this model. I'm not gonna go through it in depth, um, but essentially this provides for 11 days of commercial fishing, Tangle nets utilized prior to 913, the different weeks with the areas uh, available to fish. Um, this provides for a daily limit of two in the marine area, mark selective starting August 1st, natural and hatchery coa retention with daily limit of two. That's repetitive. Um, and then for freshwater, we would close the, this, this model would uh, close the freshwater systems that don't have hatchery supplementation. South Fork, Willapa, and Nemo Rivers would close October 1, and we would release all unmarked Chinook and unmarked Coho. Next slide, please.
And to remind folks of what that fishery package looks like, if, if I didn't capture it in the map well enough, um, this is on the backside of, of one of your handouts that you, that you should have received um, earlier this week or last week, sorry. Um, that kind of just walks you through the marine area, what the catch would be. So, so going forward, all models up until model E will not be changed of this fishery. So just want to remind folks that it's going to look exactly like this, um, the proposed models. Next slide, please. So the first model that we received, first proposal that we received is called model B. It's a commercial proposal. Uh, this model meets all management objectives that Mark laid out for us. So 11% on Willapa River and 18.7% for Chinook on Nacelle River. Uh, an expected, ex, uh, expected harvest of 13,906 coho with a goal, if we remember, of 13,600. And with coho, uh, 36,257 for chum, sorry. Uh, with a goal of 35,400. This allows for 20 days of fishing. Uh, it opens the south end of the bay to fishing in August, starting week 34. There are five weeks of tangle net proposed and five weeks of small mesh proposed. And there are no changes proposed to the sport marine and freshwater systems. So on this map, again, uh, you'll see the areas that, that are proposed are circled in red and none of the other, there's no other changes to um, the, the freshwater fisheries in this, in this model. Next model, please. I'm sorry, next slide. <laughs> uh, so you will see some yellow here. That's just indicated of what changed from the model prior to this model. So this is another commercial proposal that we received, model D. Again, this model meets all management objectives with 11.1% and 18.6% for Chinook, 14,022 coho, and 36,234 chum. This allows for 22 days of fishing. It opens the south end of the bay to fishing in August starting week 34. There are five weeks of tangle net and six weeks of small mesh proposed. This proposal opens area 2R in week 41. <clears throat> and again, there are no changes in the sport marine or freshwater for this proposal. Next slide, please. This is model C. And this was a, a staff recommendation. And, and really it was put together because at the time of this presentation, we hadn't received uh, many proposals, and we really wanted to encourage conversation um, with all you folks about these proposed models. Um, and so that's why, why we've included this one tonight. Um, this model meets all management objectives with a 10.7% on the Willapa River and 18.4% on the Nacelle River for Chinook, 13,800 coho and 35,665 chum. It allows 23 days of fishing. There's no fishing in week 34. And there's no change to the uh, sport marine or freshwater in this proposed model. And you can see the changes uh, in the yellow there from the prior model. Next slide, please. And model E was suggested just this last weekend. So we modeled it today. Um, and this meets all management objectives, 8.3% and 6.4% for Chinook, 15,013 coho and 35,435 chum with a uh, goal of 35,400. This proposal suggests 11 days of fishing for the commercial sector. Uh, it suspends fishing in 2T entirely. It proposes no fishing in 2U, 2N, 2M until October 1st. And it allows for fishing during weeks 40 through 43 in areas 2U, 2N, 2R, and 2M. 
Uh, this proposal also increases the daily limit to three adults instead of two hatchery Chinook on the NEMA. And it also proposes that a return to the original rules in the NACEL to allow recreational salmon fishing in August and September through October 15th from the Highway 4 bridge to the attraction channel. Float rule should remain in place. You can also see here that uh, the areas of commercial fishing are also highlighted. And there's again, uh, <clears throat> the changes uh, on the map to the Highway 4 attraction channel is crossed off. That would be open. And then the, the, the daily um, increase, the increase of the daily limit on the NEMA. So with that, it concludes my presentation and would just like to remind folks that, you know, we will still have more time to uh, receive more model proposals. Um, there's still more time for that and that we will be getting you new uh, updated models again as soon as we can um, tomorrow or the next day. So thank you for your time and uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I forgot this one was on here. Um, this just indicates that change uh, from Model E, the two bag on the NEMA would be a three bag and the highlighted box on the bottom on the Nasa River would be changed from August 16th to January 31st. Next slide, please. Thank you. And these are the links that you could submit your suggestions to on the top or email them to our Willapa Bay email address. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Jody. Thank you. Um, well, uh, this is the point in the evening where, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where we engage with you folks. Uh, uh, staff has presented a, a number of different uh, proposals that we've seen here. Uh, we're here tonight to uh, take your comments and listen to what you got to say uh, regarding uh, these proposals and uh, other proposals that you may have for staff to consider tonight. So uh, with that, um, looking at my list here, uh, first person in the queue is a 360 number ending in 932. Uh, I've allowed you to talk and I would ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Uh, this is Ross Barker. I submitted an E and a one. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear what everybody says about all the things, but uh, just one correction. Uh, what I uh, submitted in E was not a going from a two to three fish Chinook limit in the North Nema, uh, it would have strings attached. And, you know, we'd like to keep making our egg take. We did last year, uh, but it would be uh, to go to three. Uh, if, if you went to three, only one, three adult Chinook, only one could be a hen, three adult hatchery Chinook, only one could be a hen. That was the proviso. And she, I didn't hear Jody say that. Thank you for that we clarification, want, Russ. Yeah, we wouldn't want people keeping clues if we got to go to three. You know, only one should be a hen. We had about, last time I checked, we had about 8,000 surplus uh, fish were sold out of the Nema hatchery, all, all, essentially all males. And uh, they go up there and take up room and oxygen and uh, uh, would like to try that experiment. And, uh, uh, I'm very familiar with that river. It might be a good one for the nasal, but I'm not proposing it because I wouldn't be, wouldn't claim to be that. I fish the nasal, but I wouldn't claim to be that intimately knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Appreciate that. Looks like next in the queue is Eric. Eric, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? We can. All right, thank you. Uh, my comments in regard to uh, the freshwater complete closures the, of any rivers that are uh, not hatchery enhanced, uh, particularly North River. Um, North River has traditionally year in and year out been open with varying uh, 
catch limits year to year. But last year and this year, last year started with a closure. This year, you're proposing a closure. And uh, <clears throat> it, it's a little bit troubling to me when I see ample commercial opportunity not to at least have, I'll use North River as an example, um, at least for the rec guys, a, a one and done deal or even, you know, if necessary, catch and release, but at least to have the opportunity. Fact is, it's a fairly lightly fished river compared to other rivers in the bay. And just an outright closure, you know, in the presence of a commercial opportunity is that's kind of troubling. So I just, I guess I'd, I would just appreciate your reconsidering, you know, the, I said, some, some possibility of an opener with restrictions so for, for the rec people. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that comment. Next up, uh, looks like Tim has his hand up. Go ahead, Tim. I've asked you on mute. Can you hear me? I can, Tim. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple concerns about this whole mess. Uh, we've gradually eliminated the majority of the freshwater recreational fishing. Uh, dead fish is a dead fish, whether you kill it with a pole or a net, doesn't make any difference. So when you say, well, let's compare this to last year, you got to recognize you guys have cut the recreational freshwater fishing where these people live and, and, and live on these streams to the point where there's very little opportunity to the point where over half, I believe, of the recreational harvest of Chinook, the priority in the bay and every stream comes down in the Nima. Over half. You've annihilated the ability to do this. You used an argument of, oh, we got to have, a, uh, we're getting snagging in the, in the uh, Nima, which I don't like either, but it didn't bother you to snag them by the thousands out in front of the, the nacelle, pardon me. Doesn't bother you a bit. So at the end of the day, you came back and said, now we got a snagging problem. Well, we came up with a bobber rule. And then you say, well, the bobber rule doesn't work. And there's no one in the enforcement. People said it did. The problem's over. So then you come back with the list of, of people who want to close the river. Why do they want to close the river? Well, we got uh, uh, people throwing garbage. Well, I live on a public road, a rural road. They throw garbage in my dish all the time. Do I ask to close the road? No, but did you do that? Yes, you wanted to close it. You know why you wanted to close it. Because you couldn't put the impacts on the nors or the hatchery fish that you were gonna do with the nets and still give fishing opportunity for the wrecks in the nacelle. And I don't fish the nacelle and I don't even fish with a pole. It's clear as a bell. The other thing is that we went through this problem with the department repeatedly where the department went in and petitioned the commission and got pickles passed. And this go around this time, you demanded 20%. You wanted 20%. You wanted 20% last year. They turned you down. Then you call it an aggregate. They had to go shut you down with that. Um, so as we go through all of this, uh, we come back with a season where you are setting the seasons in A, in, excuse me, B, C, and D. And ironically, it's always wonders how the last three or four years, we can always get models presented by a commercial license holder and the regular public doesn't know how to even go about doing this. Doesn't even know how about going about doing this. And that's not by accident. So what did you do? You set seasons, including C, which is your recommendation, where you're going to have about a 33% of the escapement goal. You're willing to kill all the natural spawners. You go, you, you're gonna call it a success if you hit 33% of the escapement goal. You set the coho, or it's what, 96 fish? You're within 96 fish? You guys can't come within 5,000 most of the time. Which leads us to what I heard at the commission, which was a promise from this department that it would run intense in-season management. 
and make adjustments. I can tell you what that means. We've seen it 10 years in a row. You'll let the fish on the marine, you'll let the fish across the bar, you'll let them keep fishing, and then all of a sudden you'll have a come to Jesus moment, and about the time the fish arrive in fresh water, you'll shut the streams down. Now, I know that's what you're going to do. I know that because that's what you've always done. And that means it's predictable and reliable. So in times past, we had weekly updates of what the harvest was, what the landings were, what the creel counts were. Uh, you told us, uh, and we had meetings with this so we could all track it. And as you go through in-season management this year, I'm going to request that you go back to the style that you had previously when you had transparency and you publish all of those. So all of us, not just the guys that you're hanging out with on the commercial boats while you're doing your, you know, uh, uh, observing, all of us can see what is happening in that bag. So that if we see that you are sitting on your hands again and threatening to blow the escapement on Coho, Chum, and Chinook, that we have the ability to appeal to a higher authority. With that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim. Are there other comments, suggestions, stuff folks want to talk about uh, related to Willapaw Fisheries this evening? Knew I might get some hands up with that. Steve is next in line. Go ahead, Steve. I've allowed you to talk. Oh, looks like Steve has an old version. I don't know. Can I promote Steve? Leah, I don't know if you're paying attention. It doesn't look like Steve has audio. Yeah, I'm watching. Um, I prompted him to start his video, hoping that'll get his audio to connect, but I'm afraid he might be on a computer without a microphone. Gotcha. Well, Steve, if you're listening, uh, if you can uh, maybe try to call in with the call in number, uh, be happy to take your comment or question. So looks like Lance is next in line. Uh, go ahead, Lance. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. I, did, I have a question. Um, I don't know if anybody there can answer it, but. Um, as we have not made our natural coho escapement for whatever it is, five years running, four out of the five years or whatever we're at now, how do we justify a two fish wild coho take in August one when a coho for Willapaw Bay are not even in the bay August one, they're not allowed to keep them in the ocean. Um, I just, I, I would like to understand, I guess, if we have plenty of wild coho in the Willapaw Bay, I have no problem with taking them, but not making the escapement and not having local stock fish in the Bay August 1 on coho, I, I would like to know how we justify taking two non-local coho wilds when nowhere else is allowed to do that. I, I don't I don't know where that comes out of ocean fisheries or Columbia River fisheries or Grays Harbor fisheries, but as a, you know, I fish in those fisheries, they don't allow me to take them, but when they magically climb into the Willapaw Bay, we're able to take two wild coho. So I just was wondering if somebody <clears throat> you know, could answer that. Once we have our local coho there, maybe September 1st, and we we feel like we have an abundance of wild coho, then I guess I would be fine with taking one or two or whatever you think is reasonable. 
But until we see that, I don't know how we can justify taking wild coho from basically an ocean fishery. That'll be my first question of the night. I don't know if anybody wants to answer that now. Well, me being the new guy on the block, uh, Lance, I, I kind of want to defer to some of the regional staff. I see James Losey turned his camera on, so maybe James wants to take that one. Hey, Lance, there's um, a few of us here in the room that uh, haven't been focused on Willapa Bay for as long as you have. Um, so I might even lean back on you a little bit for this question. So my understanding is um, if you look at the way we model our fisheries, um, the marine coho fishery really has three options. You know, we can have a, a, a fishery where you're allowed to retain a wild coho or a hatchery coho. You can have a mark selective fishery or you can completely close the marine fishery in Willapa Bay. So those are sort of the, you know, three options. Of course, there's nuances in between there. Um, my understanding is the, the mark selective fishery uh, in the bay as well as the harvest of wild coho fishery are extremely similar in terms of the number of uh, natural mortalities that they incur when you model them. And that's because of a high release mortality in Willapa Bay. Um, so I think you were around when some of that work was done where folks uh, investigated mer release mortality uh, in our sport fishery in the bay. And for coho, um, for reasons we don't completely understand, uh, mortality is extremely high when you hook a fish with sport gear, bring it to the side of the boat, leave it in the water, but then release it. Um, so that's my understanding. Uh, if there's other folks in the room that, you know, want to help support that, uh, feel free. But this was really about just the mortality associated with the mark selective fishery. Which I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I just, it, as we look at it and we're, we're not allowing it to go on. I mean, I, I, we don't allow it to go on in the ocean. We don't allow it to go on in the Columbia river. Or we don't allow it to go on in Grace Harbor, but I just wondered what made us special, I guess, to say that. I mean, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not at all against keeping the first two fish you catch. I think that wouldn't be a, a bad rule, but it does not seem that we've gotten to that point anywhere. Um, so I, I didn't, I just wondered how we were magically ahead of that game and, and, uh, were able to do that on a, on a fish that isn't even the more than likely not a Willapaw Bay coho. So I, yeah. Yeah. Lance, um, I think just like to be, say, I don't, I don't have a problem with you taking them. If we've got plenty, you know, when we've got surpluses to use, use them. But I don't think anybody could tell me that that August 1st, we're looking at coho that are destined for Willapa Bay. I would be shocked, but. Yeah, I hear you. Thanks for that, Lance. Thanks, Lance. It looks like uh, Ross was next in line. Go ahead, Ross. Yes, I, like I say, I, I kind of agree with Lance. I don't know if the political would ever be possible, but but ocean co have a terrible mortality rate of being released with wild ones. I've always felt keeping the first two was the way to go, but uh, that's probably not going to happen. Um, I would just say a couple things. I I uh, I do uh, buy into best available science. It seems to have made it into the hatchery policy now. Made it through a CEPA review. Heavens knows how many more reviews coming, but uh, and I'm concerned that we're not using that in our hatcheries. You know, we don't have enough uh, uh, naturally spawned genes for Chinook to even think about meeting pihas, pinab, and getting fish on the gravel. And, I, and I'm worried about that. I'm even more concerned with models A through D, okay, which are similar to the last 80, 88 years. I'm even more concerned that if we don't improve on models A through D, I'm very concerned that my children and my grandchildren won't be recreational fishing for Chinook. That's where we're headed. And uh, the standard inside the box, first four models, uh, we seem to be, and, and I would ask uh, 
Mark, correct if I'm wrong, but we seem to be assuming that if we get a up to 20% mortality rate, that that negates the policy goal of uh, recovering wild fish. And uh, that's not my understanding of what we want to do. But I would ask, Mark, uh, is that what happens? If, if we can go up to 20%, is that okay if we reduce uh, wild fish, for example, in the Willapa River? Is that okay in your four models? Well, I guess uh, how I would respond to that, Ross, is that uh, we receive guidance uh, to stay within certain management objectives, and we try to craft fisheries that uh, appeal to all the sectors uh, that are within our policy. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, us going up to between 14 and 20 is going to have a huge detrimental effect. Uh, we do have in-season information from fisheries that allows us to stay on top of what we're seeing on an in-season basis and make decisions that, that we think are best for the resource. So I guess that's kind of my basic answer and would offer anybody yeah, else uh, that, that's on to, to I, jump in. I, I hear that, but when I... and, and... Maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but when I look at, at your uh, models, okay, I see uh, a category of wild fish in the Willapa River. There are, are X amount of wild fish in the river, in the Willapa River, that are called harvestable. And the, the impression that gives me and other folks is that that means if we, if we think we're going to be above the uh, Willapa River goal, then it will be okay to kill enough to get down to the goal, okay? But when we're only at 70% of the basin goal, I don't think that is okay. I don't think there are any extra wild fish anywhere that are harvestable uh, until we meet 4,500 or whatever the big goal is. So uh, what are harvestable wild fish in the Willapa River? Well, I think you could what say that. that I think you could say that anywhere, Ross, where we have uh, natural stock concerns. I think uh, we we accept certain levels of impact at certain management thresholds, uh, just as a result of being able to prosecute fisheries. Um, you know, uh, I my background is primarily in Puget Sound, where uh, you know we're we're having lots of impact on on all sorts of different wild stocks um, as we try to meet our conservation goals. And I understand that, and that's really, that's really the heart of my second major concern. I think I will be all right, okay, for a few more years. But uh, in Puget Sound, I don't see things being recovered. I see the governor's uh, special task force on how are we doing recovering Chinook. And even after the, the Yankees come in, because they're threatened or endangered, they're not getting recovered. And uh, uh, And so... Uh, I hear what you're saying, I think, and that was one of my questions. What you're saying is when you get guidance for up to 20%, then you no longer need to increase wild Chinook in the Bay. Is that right? I don't think that's what I'm saying at all. Okay, what are we saying? Well, I think what I was saying was that we were given guidance to go up to 20%, but that doesn't mean that we have to go all the way there. Th that's my understanding of that guidance, yes. I don't think uh, the guidance it, directs us to go all the way to 20%. It limits us to not exceed 20%. My, my question is, does it allow you to not make progress, to not have an upward trajectory? Uh, uh, each year you have a limit like 20% or 14%. Does that uh, negate the requirement to have an upward trajectory on wild fish in the wild Chinook in the Willapa Basin? That would be my question. And I would say we can we constantly evaluate what the trajectory is on the stock, and we can't necessarily look year to year as whether it's an upward or downward trajectory. You have to look at that over time. I understand that, and and uh, you know I was on the uh, uh, task force that advised the policy to begin with, and. There was an aha model run that showed, okay, uh, if we get on this trajectory, how long is it going to take? Okay, and we've not been on that trajectory, and so 
Uh, I'm very concerned about my children, my grandchildren, and others uh, that uh, it's just we're just not going to make it with this approach. And so, uh, I would just hope you would consider, and that's one of the reasons for option E that I suggested, and I haven't analyzed it, so I don't know how well it will work. We'll find out. But um, that was one of the motivations for option E is I don't see A, B, C, or D, uh, which are inside the same box we've been operating in for six years. I do not see A, B, C, or D creating an upward trajectory to ever recover a wild Chinook in the Willapa Basin. And you do have to look at it for multiple years, but we've been doing this for six years. And so that's multiple years. Uh, do you plan on doing the AHA model to see how long it will take with the trajectory we're on? So what I might say, Ross, is I'd be happy to answer that question, but we're really here to talk about this year and this year's fishery package and, and whether or not we're going to run an AHA model, I don't think is pertinent to tonight's meeting. So I appreciate your comments. I'm going to move on to Greg because there's a number of other people with their hands up. Greg, uh, go ahead. Yeah, you get me? Gotcha, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I guess you, you kind of answered my question. Um, I, I was just curious that uh, uh, why none of the models had uh, had the uh, had ran it up to 20 percent. Um, and and I might ask staff to jump in on this one. I think most of the proposals uh, thus far didn't take us all the way to 20%. But again, mm -hmm. I want to be really careful about what I say. I'm not as intimately involved in those models as they are. Right. Well, I just, I, I'm just curious to that because it seems like to me, um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the commercial fishery is always, um, you know, we, we, we run, <laughs> we run our fishery on a daily count basically. Um, uh, because we're always able to take days away uh, it's and it seems like it's really hard to get them put in so i i mean that's why i would say run it to 20 percent if it looks like we're going to exceed 20 percent then take days away that's that's what we've done all the but at least we can set a schedule at 20 that, that i guess that was my point yeah, Greg, I, th I think uh, as it as it sits right now, we hit the coho objective um, before we hit the Chinook objective, right? So we essentially run out of coho um, before we could get all the way to the 20% on Chinook. Okay, even in the August days, huh? That's, that's kind of what I was. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Mark, if I could. Please. Uh, Greg, I could just add to that real quick. Um, we also are just modeling what was given to us. So what was proposed from folks. So um, we're not adding any creativity to what you folks have presented to us or proposed to us. Um, so it's straight from basically whoever's proposed, uh, we're modeling that to, as we interpret what that, what that means. So um, okay. the models may not go to 20% if they didn't come in that way. If that's if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So next in line, uh, we have a three six zero number ending in four two five. And I think you're go ahead to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I'm not on the screen, just on the phone. It's Francis S. Talila. Welcome, um, Francis. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, show my support for option E as well. And uh, I, I kind of like that idea of uh, uh, three fish bag, but uh, only one, uh, one hen Chinook um, as part of that bag. And uh, that will help uh, use up the surplus males that we have and uh, help you guys with your egg take, so. And the other, the other, the other uh, comment I was gonna make was already uh, addressed by, uh, by yourself uh, when you said we ran out of coho and that's why we couldn't get to the 20% on the Chinook. There just, there just aren't enough coho around to, to, to hit that impact. And so the, the coho was a limiting stock in this case. Okay, that's all I have. 
Thank you. Looks like Steve is back. Go ahead, Steve. Did we get the sound stuff figured out? I'm not seeing a microphone on my screen. Am I missing something, Leah? No, that's the same thing I'm seeing. Um, yeah, again, Steve, not sure uh, um, if you can call in on a phone or try a different way to get a hold of us. We'd love to take your comment. There should be a phone line in the confirmation email that you received for the webinar tonight. Looks like. Tim is at the top of the queue. Go ahead, Tim. Um, I want to comment about retention of coho in the bay. Uh, the history showed that uh, the Ashbrook study, so on and so on, that the coho, when they're coming through that bay, go into a lethargic condition. And when we tried to use a, a years ago, tried to use a, a trial selective fishing with the nets, uh, they called it the coho slaughter or something like that. We had dead fish everywhere floating into the, it was just horrible. So there's been a conclusion reached that selective fishing doesn't work in the marine waters. Okay. And so catch and release with a pole, uh, you could be out there catching and releasing and killing an awful lot of fish before you get to the two hatchery fish. So that was kind of the argument that I remember as to why you would have a uh, catch and release in the bay be, uh, because, uh, or a retention in the bay. And as far as uh, the fairness doctrine with the, our friends across the bar out in the ocean, we were on catch and release and they're on retention of Chinook. And no one that worked for this department ever raised the issue of fairness, even though we did repeatedly. I don't think that's appropriate at all. They can retain Chinook. But we can't get Chinook escapement across the bar. They can retain unclipped Chinook. Okay, so that doesn't get there. And the other thing is, is I'm going to go back to my concern about in-season management, and I know it's very critical of you guys, and the, not you guys, you guys weren't here, <laughs> the history of this department, okay? And you have to have a criteria, a standard, okay? It's X. When we reach X, we got to pull an emergency rule. That triggers this, okay? There's standards you have to go to. If you have no standards, no limits, no triggers, and you're going to sit back and say, well, it just depends on how in the hell we feel about it on Tuesday, boys. If that's what you've got, I have no faith whatsoever. You'll ever use it in a professional fashion. So I would, uh, uh, in addition to being asking that you put out the sales or the, excuse me, the, uh, the ha harvest rates that are going along, I would really ask that you also identify what the criteria is that you're going to use as you do in-season modeling. Okay, in-season management adjustments. What is the criteria? We would like to know what that is. And uh, finally, the coho is always going to be a problem. Uh, you set the season. It was option C. I think Marlene said that we got this all from the outside. Well, it's option C right here says it was from the department staff. And you guys recommended a season that uh, pushed 18, almost 19%, right to the wire on Chinook and within 100 fish on coho, even though we haven't reached coho escapement for the last five years. So you're pushing the thing right to the wall. Uh, you can't get any closer to a recipe for failure. And I believe the only way you will succeed is if the fishing is poor enough that the pressure backs off including from our commercial friends. And at which time you might make it, not by your intentions, not by your skills, but by blind accident. Andy and the boys don't come 
is the only way. You will not fail the escapement on all three species. That's the way I see it. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Looks like Lance is next. Go ahead, Lance. Uh, a couple questions, and and uh, I, I didn't know if we wanted to speak to doing in season test fishing stuff tonight or not. One question. Um, I, I, I I just want to say something for Ross. Mm -hmm. I, I believe you're correct, Ross, and that your grandchildren may not see any fish unless we keep raising hatchery fish. Um, I think that this department and and the the look at Willapaw Bay is not a a Chinook raising bay and it's not, the rivers aren't made for it. The system's not made for it. We're doing something in the Willapaw Bay that is basically a fish meant for anglers to catch and commercial people to put on the market. And that's what they are. We, we talk about wild fish from a natural perspective. They're all hatchery strays. So we, we make it seem like we're protecting some wild fish that's been in Willapaw Bay for hundreds of years. And it's just simply not the case, but um, I, I, I thought when I looked at the models, I, I believe you put up the model for the north end of the bay wasn't even anywhere close to 20%. I thought it was like 11% of most of the models, but so I don't, I don't know how we talk about, oh, you're squeezing everything right to the end. I think our other model on the south end of the bay was 18 something. I mean, that's it seems like nobody's happy unless we're not fishing. So I wonder why, you know, I listened to Don, look at these numbers. We look at the state's escapement goals on natural fish. We're there. If none of us fish, we will make that natural escapement goal, both Chinook and Coho. But we don't see that model for inside of Willapaw Bay. We see it for the ocean, but nobody's put in a zero fishing day for both wrecks and commercial and just let it run for 20 years like that. And let's see where it goes. But everyone wants to fight over who's going to get what fish. And we've got to stop doing that and come to the point and realize that these fish are going to be, they're going to return to this bay are not going to survive in August and September and October in our rivers. We got this magical wand that we think we're going to wave and we're going to get all these wild fish to come back. We've got to stop fiddling with this and realize these fish in the early part of these seasons are for harvesting for us to catch for you guys to catch let's raise them and catch them and look at some other run of fish if you want to try to save it that comes later in the year because you aren't saving these early fish and i think we're going to have nothing but catastrophes if we keep running huge surpluses up these rivers nema nacelle it's just gonna we're not gonna we're just gonna kill ourselves so that's all i have to say Thank you, Lance. Next in the queue, we have a 360 number ending in 793. I've asked you to unmute. And if you're talking, we can't hear you yet. How about now? We got gotcha. you. All right, this is Andy. I'd like to reiterate what, what Lance just said there. You know, if, if we really truly think we're going to save this fish, why don't we have the zero option of nobody fishing? Because as one person spoke, how many harvestable fish do we have in the Willapa River? We're not pushing that to the limit. We're, I think one of the models goes to 11.1, and the majority of the impacts are 7% going to the recreational fishery. So do we want to close the recreational fishery to get back 10, 15 more fish? What the commission did say was, do we need some, you know, something to drive the local economy or we're going to use these fish to enhance whatever recreational and commercial fishery we can have to, to benefit everybody? That was some of the commission guidance. One other thing, we're not going to the 20%. Most of them are 18, 18, four. 
We're supposed to maximize the commercial fishery to make it a viable fishery. Okay. We can, as other people have spoke, we, they want to create ways that the recreational fishery can enhance their fishery or maybe remove more males. But if a commercial fishery removes the male, is that bad? Uh, I think that's what we're supposed to have the commercial fishery there for to harvest the excess hatchery fish. Okay, those are my comments. Now, my question. Um, was there anybody that took a look at a six hour opener and what the harvest rate might be compared to a 12 hour opener in some of the areas. Did anybody look into that for the commercial opening? So Andy, maybe I'll uh, take a first stab at that and then uh, James can jump in. Um, staff has been discussing that uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, I know that uh, Jody and Marlene and Chad um, have kind of done a, a quick look at what information we had. Um, I think some of those calculations are going to take some time to dig through. Uh, I know we've also been reaching out to some of the staff in Puget Sound uh, to see if they have any kind of uh, calculations that they've used over time that are kind of already uh, built in that we wouldn't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. but. Also knowing that the fisheries are different between Puget Sound and Willapaw. Uh, so it is something we've looked at. I don't think we've landed on anything specific yet, um, but maybe I'll stop there and, and give James the, the mic. Yeah, Mark, I, I think you're right on. And just for a little background for folks that aren't familiar with this proposal, um, with a net fishery, changing a fishery from 12 hours to six hours, you know, obviously cuts the time in half. But we know from experience in other places on the coast in Puget Sound, like Mark mentioned, it doesn't necessarily cut the harvest rate in half. And we have some examples where, in fact, we don't see a de decrease in harvest rate associated with the decrease in the fishery that way. So the goal here is just to model it uh, closely. Um, the one piece I would add to what Mark said that I think is important is we also are really interested in understanding, uh, you know, improving our modeling capabilities by understanding what a fishery from 12 hours to six hours may mean in terms of the math. So without that in place, you know, supportive of the concept, uh, but just need to make sure this first year, if that were to move forward, we would, uh, you know, sort of move cautiously, uh, maybe err on the side of conservation um, instead of over predict the savings associated with that fishery. Yeah, so my, my comments to that would be, right, we don't know, but if you don't try it, we won't know. The pros to that are six hours easier for you to track and monitor than 12. The biggest con is, as we try to craft our fishery and maximize them, sometimes we give something up and we never get it back. That would be the biggest con on that one, but I think it's something the department could look at for the Chinook, and not, not for the coho fishery, but maybe for the Chinook fishery, maybe try it once or twice and see where it takes us. At the end of the day, if we catch too many, we realize they're gonna take some days away. But maybe for the future, if it saves something, maybe it's something we can work with to maximize uh, more hatch retake of the Chinook. Thanks. Yeah, long story short, the proposal's on the board, so really appreciate you bringing it forward here. That's all I got for now. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Looks like Cynthia is next in line. Go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hey, um, I'm going to go back to uh, the uh, the individuals that own property along the Nacelle River, and I know Tim Tim Hamilton, I believe, uh, mentioned a few minutes ago that um, you know it's the way it is. Uh, he lives uh, on a on a public road, and people drop garbage in front of his driveway all the time. But I wonder how Tim would feel if people came and dropped garbage on his front porch. 
and um, told you that it's just as much their property as it is his property. Because that's what is happening to the people who own property along the Nacelle River. And I, I just want to make sure that the fisheries are aware. You know, you talk about the fish and you talk about the wild and you talk about this and that, but you really need to start considering the people who live along the river and who own the property along the river. And I'm getting so many mixed messages on what the water line is and who determines the water line. Who is out there telling these people that the water line is this, but yet it's this. And I think that there's a lot of false information that's going on out there. And, it, and for us as homeowners and landowners, it's really difficult to talk to a fisherman who is trespassing on your property. And James, I, I know I, I do wanna to talk to you um, separately about this, but it, it is an important issue that, that the fisheries needs to address. You have people park right by the bridge up here, but I never see a sign about river is closed. Yesterday, I had to go down to the river because there were people fishing in the Nacelle River. I didn't say anything, I called fish and game, but they're fishing. There's no signs up there that said the river is closed. Um, there's nothing that indicates these people are not legally allowed to be there. And I think the state should be putting up signs saying that they can't, you shouldn't be trespassing on private property either. So there is a, there's, the information is not being told correctly, whatever that information is. And if people get to start fishing on the Nacelle River beginning August 14th above the bridge, um, the social media is gonna be crazy. There's gonna be people from all over the Pacific Northwest on the river when, um, you know, just trespassing through, because I see it on a regular basis. So a couple of things. I just want the water line to be defined properly. We've had two or three huge floods there this, this winter. The water line has changed. We have a lot of cliffs now because the, the river has taken so much of our land. So those things need to be addressed. And I'm all for, for recreational fishing, but I'm not for the trespassing. And there's no, there are not clear definitions on where people are allowed to fish. And I know they can be in the river and that's fine. I have no problem with people who want to just stand in the river and fish. That's fine. But I don't want people on my property when they leave all this crap around and, and bring their drugs and uh, high on meth and whatever it is. So, and just to give you a little perspective, my grandfather, he homesteaded this property that we live on over a hundred years ago. And people would come down fishing. We'd have the local people come down and fish. And it was, it was a social thing. It was a, it was a wonderful thing that people could come down and fish. And now it's become a whole different world. It's no longer the local people coming to fish along the Nacelle River. It's people coming from all over. I mean, I've talked to people who come from, crap, they come from the East Coast. And um, it's getting really annoying. And I do not have clear clear guidelines from the fisheries department. And I'd like to hear that. I'd like to see that. And I would certainly uh, not um, propose that we uh, open the open the fishing on uh, in August on the Nacelle River above the bridge. It's just, it would just not be a good thing. It, it, something's going to end up not working, right? So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Hey, Cindy, thanks uh, again for speaking up. Um, last public meeting, I heard your feedback, took notes there, but I think like you mentioned the the real work's gonna get done, you know, your communication's gonna be most effective if we kind of move off of the public meeting format and you and I and the rest of the team really discuss these issues. Cause I think you're, you know, we got your proposal on the board um, in terms of uh, when uh, you want fishing not to occur. So took notes there, but if you've identified these hot spots where we've got kind of communication gaps with our anglers, we've got drug issues, enforcement issues. Um, you know, I think you've got my email. We really need to touch base on that. So I, I just really appreciate you speaking up about it again um, and excited to kind of get us to work on that stuff you're bringing up. Thank you.
Looks like uh, Greg is next in line. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, I would just like to uh, get back to what Andy was saying. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of proposed some six hour periods to try and uh, on the commercial sector. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, we're talking one to two days a week. You know, there is plenty of time to make adjustments if we're wrong. We do it every year. We do it every year. So um, it's it's kind of, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of take offense to it as, uh, as, well, we just don't know. Well, you know, the reality is, is you can, you can plan a hundred day fishery in our fishery because you're going to take 90, 90 of them away. So I, I don't understand what the big deal is, I guess, as far as, I mean, you know, we, we, we all go by, you know, we, we, we know what the, what our days are, you know, if they, if they get taken away, we know. So um, we have very active monitoring. We know what's going on in our fishery, you know, through observers who talk to the managers. So, you know, I, I just really wish you guys would, would, would have some consideration in that and, and uh, think about, what what we're trying to ask and uh uh another comment that i couldn't agree with cindy more and i know you know everybody looks at my comments as well he's just a greedy gilner he doesn't want people you know fishing in the river and uh uh i i will i will say that to you know to I, it, it is maddening to to wake up at five in the morning and there's somebody standing in your backyard you know they're they're not walking down the river they're not, you know, they're sneaking through and, uh, it, it, it's, it's no fun. And, and I, I, I know that, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, lumping everybody into one. There's always bad eggs and everything, but you know, it's, it's, it's a bad, it's bad. It's bad around here. And, uh, I, I wish you guys would come and, and check it out, you know, for the, for the property owners on the Nacelle river. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more with what she said. It, it needs to be addressed. So, um, and, and I support that. Uh, it's been, it, it was, it was closed for a long time to October 16th. And uh, um, it, sh it should remain closed from the hatchery to the bridge. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And I, I might just um, put this out there and, and I see James has his camera on, so maybe he wants to follow up with what I say. But um, I think what I heard James say earlier is that the, the proposals on the table for a shorter hour opening, uh, we're still examining it. And I think from, from our perspective, Greg, it's, it's really, we just wanna make sure that we're being really thoughtful uh, about that proposal and, and the potential impacts. Uh, and I think we just, uh, as we're building information and building towards that, we just want to make sure that we have the right approach and that we're able to capture what those those effects are in season. So, and I don't right. know if J James has anything he wants to one add. One other there. one other comment to that too, as well, is the all the modeling that you guys have right now is for big mesh with a full fleet. You know, uh, and 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 I feel like it took us a long time to get to. Um, uh, from Labor Day to the middle of September, when we when we changed that with TangleNet, um, you know, with getting the numbers correct, and and I feel like right now that you're looking at numbers that you know that it's not accurate data. Uh, the efficiency of our tangle nets, that which which were which, you know which is proposed for that fishery, is a lot less than what you have data on, and that's why we've pushed you guys to say. Uh, you know, we need some sort of data. We need some sort of in-season management. We need something to go off of. And that's why we've proposed test fisheries. We've proposed stuff. That's why we're, that's why we keep beating on you on this is because the numbers that you're looking at are not accurate to what our fishery is now. It's what it was years ago because we haven't even fished in August for years now. So, you know, all you have is uh, the numbers you have aren't correct. You know, we, it, it's a lot, it's a lot more inefficient than, than, uh, than what the numbers you have. 
Hey, thanks, Greg. I'm not going to um, get in a big argument about how consistent the fisheries have been over the last few years, because we just may not agree on that. Um, we spent a lot of time with the spreadsheets and the numbers and uh, feel really strong about the modeling work we do, particularly the last three or four years. Um, but what I, what I will say um, is, you know, that's really the problem we're having with, if we call it a problem with modeling 12 to six hours is because we want to have accurate numbers. And what we've noticed, and I, I know I'm not trying to raise an alarm or, you know, raise the temperature at all in the room, but um, in fisheries that we're really familiar with uh, moving between 12 hour and six hour and 36 hours, these are tribal gill net fisheries in Puget Sound. We spent a lot of time, uh, you know, analyzing these data. And what we notice often is when you move a fishery from 12 hours to six hours, you actually have an increase in the number of fish harvested. And this is because people have a six hour window. Um, we see that they're extremely efficient during that time period. And I'm not suggesting that's what's gonna happen here. But what I am suggesting is taking a 12 hour day to a six hour day and cutting the harvest rate in half. We, we are fairly certain that's not accurate. So trying to find that sweet spot where we're not overestimating the savings associated with it or uh, underestimating is really what we're looking for. So we're working on it. I think we're gonna get there. Um, just don't have the answer you want now, but uh, my, my answer for sure is you know, not that we just don't know, it's that we're working on it. So I'm pretty confident we're gonna get there. So thanks, no, Greg. James, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that uh, in the data that you know, uh, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think the last three or four years, we have adjusted the data from the time or in the, in the times that we fished, you know, from, from basically labor day to the 15th, it's taken a few years to adjust those numbers down to a more accurate number. And I just know that when we were, uh, at, I, I was having conversation with staff about the numbers prior to labor day. And those numbers were uh, based on uh, a night fishery with, Lord, large mesh gill net with a full fleet. And th those are the numbers that I'm questioning, not the ones, not the ones after Labor Day, because we have data on that now. And I'm glad because it's taken us, a, it's taken us that many years to get the correct data on to, 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 to where our fishery reflects what's modeled. Because when we first started this, it was way out in left field. And now they've come more in line. So I'm not, I'm not quite, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to insult anybody about the data. I just know that, that we went through that for the last three or four years prior to Labor Day. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. Thanks, Craig. Looks like uh, Lance is next in the queue. Go ahead, Lance. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, Steve Gacky is trying to get online. So if you could explain to him on his phone how he can get on there, he would appreciate that. I'm sure he's listening, but I'm trying to explain it to him, but I'm not very good at that. So um, the, with what Greg's J saying, James, and I, this, this is so that we're all on the same page. Um, we come to a meeting like this and we want to throw out our ideas, our information, you know, what, what we're thinking. Um, I don't want you to think we're attacking you or anything like that, because if it doesn't come out at this public meeting, then you get scrutinized by other people that say you're doing something behind closed doors. So that's why we're trying to come to these meetings and throw this out here so everybody can listen to it. The idea of doing this, you can run as many paper models as you would like. And I'm not, once again, I'm not attacking you until we actually go fishing in that time frame because, you know, we, we've all been fishing there a long time. And when you change the style of net and the time frame of when we fish from dark to daylight, it's turned our world upside down. And we don't know where it's gonna, where it's gonna end up. And I don't think you can guess where it's going to end up either. It's no different than trying to predict it. The only way we're going to learn about it is to go try it. We may be wrong. We're not going to sit here and tell you we're right, you're wrong. But you can model it however you want until we actually go try it. And, it, you know, it may not work for us. It may not work for you. It may be perfect. It may give us a tool that you have more control over. 
Uh, we're not going to sit here and say, yeah, we're going to catch more fish in six hours and 12 hours uh, you know, or less fish in six hours. But until you go look at it, you can't give it a number or give it a, you know, whatever you want until we go see what it is. And I think that's all we're saying is let's put this out here. We want to get started on trying to have a commercial fishery that survives. Now, if our goal is not to have that, I guess that's another path we need to take. But if we're going to stay on the plan that we're on now, we're not going to survive. You can obviously see our fishery is pretty small, to say the least. So we're trying to figure out ways to harvest fish, which you guys have asked us to do in a time frame when hopefully, you know, what we're going to see, we don't know. Maybe there'll be less wild fish then. Maybe there'll be more wild fish then or natural fish or whatever you want to call them. But until we go look at it, and if we go out there and catch a bunch of natural fish, you're going to take a bunch of days away. And we're, next year, we're going to come to you and say, that wasn't a good idea. So, but it's not like we're going to go out here and harvest a bunch of fish and, and not, and just keep right on fishing. I mean, you know, that it was not what we've done when we've gotten anywhere close to the model saying you're going to reach your goal. We just stripped the days away. We've done it every single year. We haven't added any days to our stuff. Last year, we took a day away and we added a day and everybody acted like, Oh my God, the commercials got an extra day. We took a really good day away, which we should have harvested a bunch of coho that were surplus and, you know, we lost them. But this is all stuff we have to work together with and figure out where we're right and where we're wrong. Um, as for people on your private property, it, it, it's, it's not just on the riverbank. I mean, it, it, you people that have property and everybody lives in a home, hopefully, and like Greg and Cindy are saying, when you wake up and somebody tells you that they have more right to be on that property than you as the property owner, it's frustrating. And I think we need to come to the point and you either need to come to the point as a state, you know, you said over and over, we're promoting sport fisheries. We're promoting, we're promoting, we're promoting, we're promoting Willapaw Bay. But the landowners are going to get to the point where they're going to say no more. We're not allowing anybody to come here. Not, not even after October 16th, they're going to get to the point where they just say zero access. And, and you've got some pretty big landowners on the phone right now that control a lot of that property. So it, it's very important that you try to work this out now before you lose it all. Because that's what's coming next is, is these people are going to get together in a meeting in Nacelle and they're going to, it's what happened before. This is not, this is not a new revolution. They did this before you, the state closed all that area because the landowners got together and said, I'm tired of this. Now this grand policy came along and said, Oh my God, this would be a great idea. We've forgotten about what happened. And I can tell you, you're about one meeting for most of those landowners getting together and you're not going to fish not only above the bridge, you're not going to fish below the bridge. And, you know, most of the wreck people on here don't fish in an ACL. It's it, maybe this doesn't happen in other places. Maybe the Willapaw River is a perfect deal and nobody fights over there and nobody tells landowners to go to hell that they own it. That they, I, I've been at Greg's house and listened to people say, I bought a fishing license, I can go across to your property. The state sold me a license and that gives me access across your private property. And you can put everything you want on the internet to people. And I know there are good fishermen. I know there are bad fishermen in, in anything you do, but I can tell you from living there for 50 years, you're getting a lot more bad fishermen coming up than you are good. So somewhere you've got to get together before these landowners gang up together and just close the whole thing for you. Hey, um, let me just real quick, Lance, reply to that kind of first group of comments you had there. Um, so I hope there's no uh, no thinking that you're hurting anyone's feelings here. I'm seeing a ton of respect and great feedback and good comments. So I think this process is is you know working. So thanks for all the feedback and definitely 
not taking any offense any of your comments here um and then uh in terms of the the proposal from 12 to six hours that i think the good news is i think we're agreeing on everything and we're on the same page so that we both want to see what the math looks like and we need to run a fishery to figure it out or just uh trying to figure out how to how to put it in the model so thanks for everything um i'm hearing you yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna throw my last deal at you again <laughs> you know what it is so we need we need to we need to figure out these runs because I, I truly believe that that we're we're getting a lot more fish back than what we're getting credit for. And we've talked about it. And, and I, I hope I just I bring it up only because I want you to know I'm not going to let it sleep. So until we figure out a way to do this, then I will sit in as many meetings as you want to sit till we figure it out. But until we get a more accurate way and it's not anything against Lyle or his team but I, I think they do the best they can, but we have to come up with a more accurate way. So, and if you could, uh, if you could shout out to Steve and let him know what to do to what buttons to push on his phone, he, he would, he would appreciate that. Hey, let me just, yeah, while well, Mark works on that phone uh, issue, uh, Lance, so everybody else on the phone knows what you're talking about there. You don't need to rehash it, you know, for me, cause we've had extensive discussions, but we're talking about, um, what Lance is maybe describing, correct me, Lance, but uh, this idea that maybe there's some missing unmarked fish in the freshwater terminal area. So uh, the technical team, you know, me included, we're working on uh, tracking mark rates from the commercial fishery to the marine sport, to the hatchery, into the freshwater sport, and then onto the spawning ground. So this is work we're doing, but, um, you know, just to make sure all these numbers are right. And it's similar work that we're always doing, but Lance, you know, has asked us to look a little closer at those mark rates. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate it. And, uh, and we're working on it. All right. Thank you. So I see a phone number on here that ends in four, four, five. It's a three, six, Oh, number. Uh, I'm gonna allow you to talk and you're going to have to unmute yourself on the phone. Uh, by hitting star six should allow you to speak. Somebody told me that might be Steve's number if he is able to hit star six and talk. I noticed that the number has joined twice, Mark. Yep. So yep. we might have issues with that. Yeah, Steve, I'm not sure if you can hear us. I would just encourage you to try back. It looks like you're on our screen twice. Uh, not quite sure why that is, but uh, Steve, I would also encourage you, you know, you have uh, you have all of our contact information, I believe, and, and would just encourage you to reach out to staff with any questions or comments you have. I see Ross has his hand up again. Go ahead, Ross. Uh, yes, I just make a comment on Lance's uh, comment on G, only 11% uh, uh, more rate on Chinook in the uh, the uh, Willapa River. But, but I, I did the math, and, and we're down so low. You know, In other words, uh, I compared uh, Model A to Model B. And uh, 11 point whatever percent mortality rate of wild Chinook in the Nasal River, I mean, in the Willapa River, okay, that killed more wild fish than 18% did going to the Nasal. And the reason is there's no fish left, no wild fish left in the Nasal. 18% of nothing is nothing. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the box we're in. And I think the only thing Lance and I disagree on is whether wild fish are important or not. But uh, I'm afraid that. Until something changes, we have to accept the fact that uh, the federal government thinks they're important. And look how they've hammered the Columbia and hammered the Puget Sound. And, and I and my children and my grandchildren would sure like to avoid that. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. see Tim has his hand up. Go ahead, Tim. 
Uh, the point that I'd like to make is that whether you agree with it or not, there's two production zones, hatchery and gravel. And it's not wild versus hatchery because it's where they're born and raised, whether they go through the survival of the fittest. And every standard that I've seen requires a blend of natural spawning genetic genes into hatchery runs. It's been that way since I came on board in the 1990s. We didn't call it HSRG, we call it professional management. <laughs> and it was taught to us by your department. It's still there. It's still on the federal level. It's still on the ESA radar. And we talk about the orcas as an example and increasing hatchery production. We are so far out of whack with the hatchery production coming out of the nacelle that it can trigger a lot of ramifications, including if we can't restore a certain amount of natural spawners, those natural spawners are gonna be a limiter to how many hatchery fish you can release. And we're in a ticking time bomb. And one of the reasons why the policy was originally set up was to restore those natural spawners so that we could complement and increase hatchery production as well. Uh, I, I, I would challenge anybody on this conversation to bring any type of, of biological recognition or study in that says you can release 5 million fish with a natural spawning stock of 33% of your escapement goal. It is contrary. You couldn't sell it to Fish Biology 101 in the community college. And with the seasons that you proposed, we're not only not going to fix that, we're going to continue to drag it down. And I, I can't, I, I get so frustrated because I understand everybody wants to kill them and everybody wants to make a profit or pleasure. I, I understand that. But running this is a business. This is, this is a wiped out bankruptcy. And, you know, someone has got to address this problem in the nacelle. And the reason why we're here is, you know, Ron decided to jump that hatchery production, not once, but twice. Uh, from 800,000 to 5 million. Now you got to catch them or you're going to go bring them out as hatchery surplus. So what are you going to do? You're going to drag the natural spawners into the toilet further and further and further. And that is not conservation. That is not science. That is not common sense. But from your models that you predicted or you presented to us here today, that is what the department intends on doing one more time. And I'm sorry, that's, that's just totally depressing to me. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I see Greg has his hand up again. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, the uh, Tim and uh, Ross, just uh, the, the last two comments there. Um, maybe I'm unaware of something. I was just trying to get the, um, did they, I mean, I feel like that they might have uh, suggested that, um, that we are under the feds look for ESA or federal management, or they're looking at it because I wasn't aware of that. Um, and then uh, um, uh, I, you know, I didn't think Ron was behind the 5 million fish that went in the nacelle, but, Maybe I'm wrong on that too, but um, I thought that was done by the legislature and the whale task force. But anyway, um, but are, are we, are we under watch for the ESA in, in the Willapaw? But I didn't, I didn't think we were, but correct me, please, if I'm wrong. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, not that I'm aware of Greg. Okay, thank you. That's I just I didn't know if something new just popped up on the radar here soon. Thank you. Ross, did you still have your hand up or is that a residual?
Well, uh, I see some more hands going up. There we go. Andy, go ahead. So uh, at the beginning of the meeting, you guys said the model was uh, a touch off. I mean, is it something significant or is it just a few fish? I mean, where are we going with, so, you know, you said we're going to have another meeting to model the stuff. I mean, is it, how significant was the error? Uh, our, our assessment is it's pretty insignificant, Andy. Um, essentially, uh, we there was a, a small calculation error in some of the freshwater um, uh, daily limit adjustments. So uh, we noticed it today. Our our best guess at this point is um, it's gonna what it means like in the modeling world is it's gonna mean uh, a little less catch and probably some lower exploitation rates on Chinook. Um, uh, but it wouldn't, uh, it's not going to mean, uh, it's going to be like tenths of a percent. It's not going to be huge, huge adjustments is, is our yeah, best okay. assessment at this point. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'd like to reiterate, um, I guess to the public, you know, when, when on the six hour deal and I get, I guess for the staff too, you know, we're not asking to go to 6% or six hour days to exceed the 20%, you know, we realize we're still gonna have to stay well within the 20% if it's something that we might pursue. So we're not, we're not doing it trying to, you know, exceed the model. We're trying to do it to stay well within the model and have a better idea of monitoring the fishery. And what, you know, I would also like to reiterate, your numbers are from a nighttime fishery with big mesh now we're going to a tangle net with small or during the daytime and i think everybody knows and i maybe staff would would say yes or no but you know if the uh the harvest rate won't be the same because the the tangle net in the daytime is not going to be nearly as effective as a big mesh in the nighttime and you don't have the fleet you had of yesterday so okay thank you we'll see where the model takes us Thanks, Andy. Looks like uh, Greg is next in line. Go ahead, Greg. Can you hear me, Mark? We can. Welcome. Uh, good evening, staff. Um, Greg King here. Um, I've watched Will Paul Bay for quite a while here. Um, I think uh, commission guidance is to create a valuable sport and commercial fishery in the bay. Um, we'll just look at the uh, small communities in the bay and they afford to survive uh, under, under this policy, which is uh, pretty much a disaster. Um, and I think everybody knows it. Uh, you guys that are new to this, uh, and I'm not, I'm not as, as experienced as a lot of people on this as, as, as Lance and, and, and uh, uh, the others. Um, but I do know Willapa. Uh, I fished Willapa a lot, um, and uh, these small towns and communities they they survive on commercial and recreational fisheries. The where the policy got sideways is when you took production out of Forks Creek Hatchery and you cut it from three point five million to three three hundred fifty thousand. You killed a sports fishery in the North Bay there. Uh, and, and, and it's unfortunate you did that in the policy, and and we all know that. Um, you know, it, it this bay is not under uh, anybody looking at ESA listings. I've talked to Noah Fisheries. If you ESA listed the bay, you'd have to ESA list the whole coast. So, and, and that would take an evaluation of all coastal rivers uh, from Nia to, to Columbia River. This in this talk of this wild fish, it, it, there's there's no such thing on Willapaw Bay. Now there are some naturally spawning Chinooks, um, you know. So it, that being said, I, I'd like to know what you guys' idea about not keeping a hen 
uh, I kind of got into the conversation, into the, 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 uh, the program here a little late and I'm hearing, keep hearing this, not keeping a, a hen, a novice fisherman doesn't even know the difference between a coho and a Chinook. I think you're going to have a big problem there with people just knocking them on the head when they come to the bank. I just don't, I just don't see that. Um, you know, uh, um, as far as this, I have 1200 feet of Crick and I'm constantly keeping people out of the Crick and they're, they're picking, they're picking rocks and they're trespassing all the time. You got a nightmare there. If, if, if if we look at Willapaw, uh, there is very little public access. And there used to be 25, 30 years ago, you could get public access by knocking on a farmer's door and asking them for permission. And uh, today, those farmers have, nope, they got signs up and you're not fishing anywhere all the way from, geez, the only place you can fish, I think it's up by the hatchery on Forks, at Forks Creek. And, and uh until you get in a boat down in the tidewater. So, you know, those guys got a problem. I understand that I feel for them, which I guess what I'm saying is we, this is a big fight and it's always a fight and we got to start working together with these commercials. And it seems like, you know, they just want to fish and, and make a living. We just want to catch a fish, you know, and there's no reason we can't work together. I think the commission guidance was 20%. They just predicted, they just uh, set that just recently model it at 20 percent that's what that's what commission guidance is there's no no nothing wrong with that um we're we're just about there's be a decision on the ninth that's coming up on on hsrg and my ideas was always let's put produce 3.5 million at uh forks creek and let's produce 3.5 million at uh um at nacelle um, if we can go up at Nacelle because we got some screens fish, let's pr let's produce those fish. But let's quit fighting over the last damn fish here. This is, you know, that's what it's coming down to. And nobody wants to see that. I've talked with the commercial guys. I've talked with some sports guys. You know, we got a hard problem here that, that we need to fix. And that will only come in time. But I don't see modeling it for this one keeping, not keeping hands. I don't know how that's going to work out. You're going to have them dead on the bank and. So anyway, those are my comments. Thanks, Greg. So maybe just uh, some, I'll start talking and we'll see if other folks wanna raise their hand. Um, just wanna let folks know, uh, we're gonna be doing some check-ins from PFMC daily, uh, starting at eight o'clock. Uh, on Thursday, we'll have those details up on the website. Uh, that's 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, uh, in the past, it's primarily been a Puget Sound focus. Uh, but if there are other questions, uh, I would uh, invite folks to, to join us and listen in and ask questions. Uh, hopefully, we'll still have uh, staff on the line that could answer a, uh, a coastal or a Columbia River question. Uh, so look for that info on the website. Um, I think uh, Jody also said that we would be sending out uh, additional or an updated model with a fixed calculation, uh, as well as any other new proposals we get for folks to look at and consider. Uh, we also mentioned to you folks that we were going to have a follow-up meeting next week to let folks know where we are with uh, both the modeling uh, and fisheries proposals for this year in relation to what's happening at PFMC uh, and trying to drill down on a final proposed fisheries package as we uh, get through the rest of North of Falcon this week. Um, so with that, uh, I see once again that I started talking and people raised their hand. So I am going to recognize Francis first. Go ahead, Francis. Hey, I, I'd just like to address the one comment. I, I mentioned this at the last meeting as well. It had to do with the hen retention or hen non-retention. Um, sorting through hens is really easy. Every fall, you know, has the ovipositor sticking out of the vent. It's 100% infallible. You see that? It's a hen. No doubt about it. 
And if 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 if, if there's any enforcement issue, uh, another way, if they want to say, if you want to have an argument with someone, all they have to do is take a knife in there, slice it up. The fish is already dead; it's been retained. You want to enforce it as retention of too many hens. Someone gets a ticket. It's 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 not a hard thing to do. It's way easier than coho and chinook trying to make that distinction. Every fall fish has it, even the coal. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, let's see, Tim is next. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I wanted to offer some uh, clarification on the question about ESA status. Uh, one of the first things that uh, my group put together was a sentence that was adopted as a purpose and a policy. And that purpose was to restore natural origin spawners and avoid ESA designation. I've lived on Grace Harbor my entire life and uh, we, 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 we've been through ESA and we don't want it. But by the same token, it's also important to recognize that Coastal Chinook is in one ESU. And as it was said, it takes all of them Okay, and Woolapaw, which was way in the bottom of dragging it down, was, was always insulated by Grace Harbor and the North Coast. Grace Harbor and the North Coast, North Coast are now in trouble, and Woolapaw has to stand on its own two feet. It can't be carried anymore. And by the way, Coho is totally different. Okay, and yes, I don't believe at this point in time, NOAA is anticipating uh, moving forward with a review for ESA status. But it's also important to note that as they explain to the legislature, any citizen, any group has to file a petition and document excessive hatchery strays and failure for natural origin spawners escapement goals. And if they can document those, ES, uh, NOAA, not may, NOAA shall, has to go out and start a review so it's it's it, the, the danger we have be quite con honest with you is that we keep going down this yellow brick path where citizens call in the yankees as ross calls it triggers it and now you're going to sink us all all up and down the coast willapaw can literally bury us clear to forks and that's all of the people in all of the industries so it's really key that we get Willapaw up and running on its own feet by standards that are acceptable to where Willapaw doesn't threaten the others. And that's my position on it. And I hope to hell if we don't have to go visit the Yankees, but having a policy that worked is one of the greatest things you can use to convince Noah that we're changing our ways, we're getting better, we're fixing the problem. And that is a very, very big mitigating factor. And the problem is we passed the policy with that intention and then the department ran the seasons and it failed. So we can't use it that way anymore. How, how do you get to have anybody have any faith in that when you see these numbers? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Looks like uh, Lance is up next. There he goes. I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. We hear you, Lance. Go ahead. Yeah. So, not to fight with everybody, but uh, I'd like to say <laughs> one thing you said in that, Tim. And that was to have a policy that works. If we could all sit down and make a policy that worked for everyone instead of a policy that eliminates one, and I know you may not see it that way, but I'm almost to the point where an ESA listing in the Columbia River is a better fishery for me than it is the Willapaw River or Willapaw Bay fishery. I mean, that, that's honestly how I feel. I'm, I'm to the point where I'm almost, let's, let's go at it because we're going to take in a whole lot more people a whole lot more money but that really wasn't what i got on here to say but i, I just i kind of grinned a little bit when you said a policy that worked if, i wish we could sit down and make a policy that worked for everyone but at this point in time it seems like that is an impossibility but 
Um, I wanted to speak, James, to us looking at some sort of a test fishery. And I don't know whether that falls into something we have to do at North of Falcon or if that's something we're gonna do later, talk about. Um, I think it's something we need to look into and try to form earlier. I think we had a fishery last year that we may not have had if we would have had a test fishery. Uh, I think it would have helped the commercial fishery, you know, but just looking back on it, but um, <clears throat> I just, I just wanted to talk about it because I don't want this to come up after North of Falcon and I say, Oh God, we didn't talk about it prior to it. So we can't do it or for it to come up somewhere down the road in a meeting and, mm -hmm. and a wreck fisherman or someone else says, you know, oh, we didn't talk about that. So that, yeah. Um, maybe I'll just say something quick about that. So the rest of the group on the phone knows um, what we're thinking about here. So um, when Lance says test fishery, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lance, but we're talking about an in-season update tool that we could use in-season to uh, predict what the run size is. Um, so that would be to update the forecast. So we have a tool that's um, becoming each year a little bit more developed around coho. Um, I heard folks on the phone talk about, you know, fine tuning those thresholds so we can communicate really clearly to the public on that focused on coho. When we're talking about Chinook, we're, um, you know, even a few more steps behind where there's an interest from the commission and the state and obviously the public here to have these tools in season um, to, to update the run size of Chinook. So we explored um, some ideas last year uh, internally in season. Um, to try to see how good we were at predicting the Chinook run size. Uh, we know right now, based on fisheries that have taken place over the last few years, we're pretty good at uh, predicting the hatchery uh, Chinook run size in season, but we need, um, there's still some work to do to better understand what the natural origin, the, the group we're really watching closely in season. Um, so uh, to Lance's comment, um, what we know we need for a good in-season update tool is a fishery um, that uh, takes place in the same time, the same manner um, for multiple years in a row. That's what we want in a tool like that. So Lance, if we can design a fishery um, through the work Jody walked through, you know, these different um, models, if we can design one of those models that has a commercial fishery uh, within the um, policy guidelines, um, that we can depend on for multiple years. So it's something that if the commercial fishery went, took place one year, it was something we decided to commit to multiple years in a row. That's something we could talk about. Um, so I guess uh, anything more than that, you know, I'm hoping that within the models, within the models that you guys have um, put forward, so your preferred fisheries, hoping within those fisheries, there's some tools in there that we can use to predict the run size. So um, we're, we're thinking about it. So one of the things, James, I want to hit on on that, and in my mind, I guess, as I look at this, um, we, we do test fisheries in the Columbia River on, on spring salmon stuff. Uh, we, we used to do it a lot more when we had tangle net fisheries, when we had, when we had bigger runs to try to figure out um, when we had a couple of things, when we had less natural fish or wild fish present and when we had less steelhead present was was the goal of those test fisheries and I think that's that's some of the that's a two-pronged thing to me and that is yeah if we can model a a commercial fishery on a certain day in a certain area constantly yeah that's a good fishery but it I'm looking at it from the standpoint if we almost need to know a little bit about what our fleet's going in on sometimes before we go in on it. And that's, that's what I'm speaking to as last year in one of our fisheries, if we would have known ahead of time, we may not have opened it right then. And that, that to me is a, is the test part that um, I would like to sit down and talk over as to figuring out um, how we do that because there, there we may have a fishery in say two N, you know, in August, but more than likely as we go forward with this thing and we do produce 5 million fish or, 
or we do pump up the north end of the bay, you know, so that we can have a recreational, a better recreational fishery. Um, all, all things that are outside of the policy, obviously, what we've done, with, along with many things that we've done are way outside the policy. Um, it would be nice to be able to start looking at what we think we're going to impact. And, you know, and, and quite frankly, I think we need to do some, some studies and looking at our, our catch rates in those test fisheries so, to look at what our run should be. Because that, that's my, or my thought on, on both, you know, using the commercial fishery to help us find out how many natural fish we actually have. Because if people, if people would look at the numbers and dig into it from, you know, I know you're great at looking at numbers, Tim. I, I wish you would look at the, the commercial catch in the coho fishery last year and what we got back when those fish hit the, the, the hatchery. It does not make sense that I don't know how to fix it. So if we could fix it, I think we would all feel a lot better about where we are with our natural fish. But that's my thoughts on that. Thanks for that, Lance. Well, I wanna take a second and recognize uh, Leah Snyder from uh, the FISH program who was here to help us through all the technical stuff with Zoom tonight. Really appreciate your help, Leah. Uh, Jody Pope and Marlene, uh, Lyle and Barb, who are our uh, Willapod team. They've all been here standing by, ready to answer questions tonight. Uh, and, and James, who you just heard, uh, the Region 6 leader there. Um, and really uh, wanna thank every all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, we always appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that everybody was respectful tonight of each other. Uh, we may have differences of opinion, uh, but we appreciate everybody kind of staying within the parameters that we've set in front of you for, for meetings like this. Uh, the dialogue is appreciated and your thoughts are appreciated. Again, I'm going to invite everybody to join us uh, later in the week as we move through the PFMC meetings. Uh, we're going to try to keep the website updated with any new modeling information. Uh, Jody and crew have committed to get you folks out some updated information, uh, take into some new uh, uh, modeling and considerations, uh, and get some information out to you folks for a meeting next week where we can uh, come together and start to center on a final package for the 21-22 year. Um, with that, uh, just want to say thanks to everybody again. Hope that everybody has a great and safe night, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, everybody.